Hi guys, welcome back to my studio and today I'm going to show you what tools you need to make your own watercolour paint. The first tool will be the pellet knife. The easiest one to get and I think the cheapest one as well. At least when you buy it from an art shop. So the pellet knife is a tool that you use for wetting your pigment uh, with your binder as you might have seen in some of my videos and for scraping the paint off the plate into a container, maybe a pan, maybe a tube, maybe a jar. Um, that really doesn't matter but this is the tool that I use for it. You can use bigger ones for that as well. Um, this is actually my favorite one and um, I've used it quite a lot of times. When you're using it on a glass roughened surface, which I have for making paint, there is one downside of metal pellet knives and you'll sharpen them like a blade. Um, I've cut myself quite often, well, maybe taking a brush or uh, a, a tool that I need. And this was just standing there I cut my finger just by touching it like this since this edge over here gets sharpened while putting it over the glass plate. I'm sharpening it every time I use it. So be careful for these when you've used them for quite a long time. Uh, fellow paint makers will know this problem. Cleaning them can be very dangerous. Um, be careful with these but these are your, I think, tool to start with and to end your process with as well. So, for me, quite important. Could you do without one? I think 90% of the job could be done without one. I couldn't live without one. So now let's talk about the muller. A tool that is a bit more expensive than a pellet knife um, and harder to find as well. I have some great options for you and I'm going to show you my very favorite one first. This is my go-to muller and about 80% of my content has been filmed with this. Um, why do I like it? It is quite a large diameter, about 10 centimeters. It is quite flat, so it has a low handle which means I have more control over it when I um, uh, speed things up and I put a lot of down pressure on it as well, which is possible with something with a low handle like this. Uh, this is from Jackson's Art and I put an affiliate link down the video um, for this and other great mothers that they have. So by using that link, you'll help me and eventually I hope to help you as well with more content. This is my go-to muller, but it's not a muller for every job. When I buy a new pigment, I'm just using a tiny bit of pigment and for a tiny bit of pigment, I need a tiny muller. This is my tiny muller. It's only used for about uh, an, eight, an eighth of a teaspoon of pigment. And um, I use this when I have a new pigment and I wanna try it or I wanna mix something, I wanna experiment. I mean, doing that next to the cupboard with my pigments, so uh, not even on my big plate over there. Um, uh, I'm just using this for experimental purposes. For big patches of paint, I use the big muller. Uh, this weighs about a kilo and a half and is, it is great for big batches of paint. Um, why is this better than the other one? It's slight larger, so you have more surface area. It's also the weight. Heavier muller means that the gravity does quite a bit of work for you. As I said, I'm using a lot of downforce on my plate and um, this does a lot of that work for me. So it's not that I only use this, uh, when I use this, I only move it around. Um, uh, I still put quite some downfalls on it. Um, uh, to get more friction to make uh, uh, the dispersion more efficient um, 
but I'm using this for big batches. Why would I never use this for a big batch? Well, uh, for those of you who can't think of that, um, if you have this and you have a puddle of paint in front of you and you try to mill everything with this, it I think your arm would fall off within, within the hour. But um, also imagine like the, a puddle of paint or just a, a big amount of paint and you go through it the paint will just go over the edge and will completely color your hands, which is beautiful in some cases, but not while making paint, because I wanna work as tidy as possible. I wanna keep my pans clean when I fill them. Um, and for that, I need clean hands as well. So those are the three mullers that uh, are farthest apart. I have something that's in between. Uh, actually, I have a couple of them, um, uh, which is like a medium sized muller it's five to six centimeters uh cent centimeters i think um i use these for um actually use three of them when i mix on my big plate on my desk over there um and i have uh, some pigment mixes that i'm working on um i want every mix to have its own muller to avoid cross contamination with pigments so this was my first muller um, with my small experimental plate that I have over over there right now. Um, I'm not using this for uh, like the big batches of paint that I sell. This is just um, something I use when using more millers at a time. Uh, I don't wanna get too much surface area. So I have a couple of these. Um, they were all made of glass, the ones that I showed you. And it has a good reason they're made of glass nowadays. Since they're easy to clean, you can uh, see what's on there. So if there's still a bit of phthalo blue on there, you can get it off. Uh, if you can see that and you want to make a batch of yellow paint and you find out later that's, that there's still phthalo blue on it, well, you can guess what you'll end up with. Um, you don't want to have that. So. Glass mullers are ideal for uh, uh, cleaning. They have a perfectly flat and most of the time roughened or sandblasted uh, uh, bottom. So um, that is for that friction to uh, disperse the paint and the pigment more efficiently. But it's not always been like that. There used to be times that everything was not made of glass of rock. Both the plate and the muller were made of a hard rock. Um, this thing is four to five hundred years old and um, I recently acquired it. I love to have this. I actually want to make paint with it one day. Uh, it is not perfectly flat but that's because the stone plates that they used were kind of curved. So it was kind of a very large mortar and pestle uh, instead of a muller and a plate. Um, but I love that this has traces of paint on it on the outside, dried, almost petrified what it looks like. I think it's old oil paint. Uh, this is just a museum piece that I recently acquired and I'd love to have this and you know see what it used to be. But I'm really glad that we're working with glass now. So those are quite expensive mullers. Um, they go from 20 to 120 euros. And um, that's quite a lot of money if you're not making paint professionally or not sure if you want to have this as a hobby. So if you want to try out making paint first, what you can do is look in your cupboard in the kitchen and see if you have maybe a whiskey glass with a thick glass bottom that's perfectly flat. Um, it needs to be perfectly flat and unfortunately I don't have a glass like that they're either structured on the bottom or they have IKEA stamped on it um, which isn't a bad thing for a glass made to drink out of but when you want to make paint you want to have something that's completely flat on the bottom so I went to the thrift shop for you and I found this this is like a candle glass with a 
sandblasted bottom part, I think to diffuse the light or something, but a perfectly flat bottom. And this can work as a muller. It set me back 70 cents. This is cheap, right? You can use this as a muller. If you want to add weight to it, I don't know, uh, maybe pour some plaster in it or, or, or concrete if you have it um, uh, to add some weight to it. But this, this can be used as a muller. I will use it as a muller too to demonstrate it for you. I found something else as well and I have no idea what this is. If you know what this is, please comment down below because I have no clue. Um, <laughs> maybe something for a napkin or cutlery or there's no hole in it for a candle. Uh, there is a flat, also sandblasted bottom. This set me down 40 cents. So for a euro and 10 cents, uh, it, it gave me two things that I can use as a muller and I just found it the first time looking for it. So um, if you don't have anything at home, uh, thrift shops, uh, uh, those are the place to go. I think uh, maybe online you can find stuff as well that are very cheap. Uh, maybe you have someone who, who uh, used to have a muller or uh, stop making paint, I don't know. There's loads of options for you out there to get cheap options, to just get a taste of what paint making is like. Uh, so you can maybe invest in more expensive or more professional tools. Then there's the surface that you're working on. I have a thick glass plate on my desk, uh, which is hardened or toughened glass, um, shatterproof, it has smooth edges so I don't cut myself, uh, it has a large working surface, but those are quite expensive as well. And there is a very easy solution to get a hardened or toughened glass surface for just a couple of euros or dollars or pounds. Ikea. So this is a Besta shelf and um, this is toughened glass. It is smooth on the edges. It's quite a large surface area for if you're just getting started. Um, and it's smooth as a working surface as well. It's not a bad thing. Uh, I'm going to show you how to roughen this up a bit. So how to uh, prepare your working surface so you get a roughened glass surface area the same as you would have on a professional muller since that's more efficient when mulling like the surface area when it's rough it's just more efficient so i'm going to show you how to do that this is a couple of euros so uh, for not even i think not even five euros you can get something with a plate and you're set right the only thing you need is a binder and pigment and but the more money you save on tools like this the more money you're left with for pigment because that's the main character of our story the pigment but we cannot make paint without a binder so let's talk about that so a binder in general is something that keeps pigments in a form of paint and it really depends on the binder what form of paint it will be so if you combine oil and pigment you get oil paint and if you can combine an acrylic dispersion with pigment you get an acrylic paint you also have a vinyl dispersion which is similar to acrylic only completely matte and if you want to make watercolors traditionally there's gum arabic. So gum arabic in its natural shape looks like this. It's a resin from the acacia tree and it can be quite orange till quite colorless in all different shapes and sizes. This is the rough stuff. You have them in bigger crystals and smaller crystals. Uh, you have them in powder form as well. I have this from Crema Pigmenta um, to show you guys. They sponsored me for this video um, and they gave me this stuff. Since I'm using this myself, I'm using crystals which are also bought from Crema. 
Um, what the difference is, I will explain later. You also have ready-made watercolor binder or readily dissolved gum arabic. The watercolor binder is something that you don't need to add anything to. You can just use it straight out of the bottle. The liquid gum arabic is just gum arabic and water. One more thing about this powdered gum arabic from Crema. Um, it's not just pulverized crystals and this comes with a very big advantage so uh, really quickly we're going uh, on about that in the process of making our, our own watercolor binder but um, they dissolved watercolor crystals and they sprayed a clean spray without any uh, sediment so without any dirt or bark of the crystal in the solution they sprayed that very finely on a plate and those drops of dried and clean gum arabic that's what makes this powder so um, it has a really big advantage over the crystals um, I like to use the crystals um, uh, I think it's just a feel of it why I like to see them dissolve and uh, you know the, the process of it. it it adds value to my process on how I feel about it um, it's not right or wrong by any means uh, but know that this powder is pure and clean um, there are powders that are not clean which is just ground up crystals just the crystals that I showed you put in a blender uh, which comes with all the tree bark with all the maybe bugs in it um, the, the the sand all the sediment that 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 went into the resin was ground up as well so you still need to clean that the only advantage of that powder is that it dissolves more quickly than the pure gum arabic crystals the downside of pure gum arabic or gum arabic that's been dissolved with water alone is that gum arabic is hard and brittle and you don't want your paint to be hard and brittle you want it to reactivate quite quickly so you need to add some things the first thing I'm adding is plasticizer uh, I use glycerin for that which makes my paint uh, reactivate more quickly so it redissolves when it is touched by water or a wet brush. Glycerin alone wouldn't be enough for me since um, I'm using watercolor paint that all artists can use. And when you're just working with gum arabic and glycerin, the downside is that it dries quite quickly. So when you're working in a wet on wet technique, you don't have as much working time. You need something else for that that's where a humectant comes in i'm using honey as a humectant uh, which is not vegan and uh, unfortunately i had a lot of people who want to buy my paint who couldn't because they were vegan and i have the utmost respect for that but after loads of trials and errors with my own recipe i found that honey just works best for me it's a natural fungicide it works as a humectant which makes my paint um, last longer in its wet state so you have more working time and it helps re-dissolve or reactivate the paint even quicker I really like the feel of it and um, you can use other things like that like sugar syrup or corn syrup but they're not that good as honey in what it should do so um, I'm sticking quite traditionally with honey although honey has only been added since the 19th century so it's not even that traditional but I just like the way it makes my paint feel uh, when you're working with a wet brush that's loaded with pigment um, I like it more than the alternatives so that's why I'm sticking with honey but if you're vegan uh, you can use agave syrup or corn syrup which is quite cheap in the US 
um, you can use a simple syrup which is just sugar and water uh, you can use anything that helps for this purpose but like I said the natural fungicide function of honey and the way that it makes my paint feel is just more preferable for me so what else is used in watercolor binder um, in my case the only thing I add is synthetic oxgal which makes uh, my paint flow a little bit more but I'm using very little of it it's a dispersant and dispersants are used by big manufacturers um, for mixing paint quite easily um, you can use it as well at home synthetic or natural oxgal uh, or any kind of dispersant that you can find which is uh, water soluble um, if you have a hydrophobic pigment and you add more dispersant you can see that the pigment mixes more easily with water but it influences how your paint acts later on so be careful with it that's the only thing I add and it's just a few drops of it on a big batch of binder big manufacturers are also known to use a brightener in some cases with very good reason Brighteners have a very bad reputation of being a filler, just being something to bulk up the paint uh, uh, to make it cheaper. You know, less pigment means cheaper paint. But a brightener can also be used to make paint brighter in its drying shift. So I'm quickly going to explain what a drying shift is. I'm going to uh, make a different video about that later on but a drying shift is when your wet paint on your paper looks very bright like a dioxazine violet for instance a very dark vibrant violet on your paper but when it dries it gets very dull almost a muted violet on your paper um, In professional paints you don't see that very often so it's uh, most of the time it's student grade paints or even kids paint where loads of brightness are, uh, are being used but also fillers uh, what are fillers that's literally to bulk up a tube of paint to fill that tube with something that is not a precious pigment but it happens with student paint and, and kids paint that's why they are so much cheaper that's why their student quality uh, paint is cheaper than the artist quality paint and why the kids uh, paint is even cheaper than the student quality paint so um, sometimes you see student quality paint that looks exactly identical to artist quality paint it's possible since uh, there are loads of pigments that are actually quite cheap so there's no use to use any filler or brightener uh, sometimes the difference is quite noticeable but we're making handmade watercolor paints and the qualities that come with handmade color uh, watercolor paint is that none of those things have been used only a very pure binder and the best pigment that you can afford could you buy gum arabic in a bottle yes should you not sure um, I think it's perfectly fine to just you know do whatever it feels best for you uh, ready-made binder like I said you can use it straight out of the bottle and don't add anything um, when you are making your own binder with uh, the stuff that I just told you about um, the thing with gum arabic from a bottle is that you're not sure how much gum arabic to water is in there so uh, the amount of water actually really doesn't matter it, it's it's going to evaporate anyway right you shouldn't put a, too much in it uh, you get uh, a binder that's too thin um, not enough will make it very hard to work with but um, the binder out of a bottle you, you don't know the proportions it's not on there most of the time as far as I know of so um, if I say okay um, you should add not more than um ten percent of your gum arabic weight uh, in honey and glycerin 
uh, to your binder, um, but you don't know the amount of gumarabic in the first case. It's very hard to to make a binder that works uh, well enough for you. It it can work. It just needs loads of more tweaking, more trial and error, and um, I think um, buying the powdered stuff, uh, you can make a binder overnight, right? So I'd, I'd say do that instead of buying pre-dissolved gum arabic. So last subject before we start making binder, before we start making paint, which pigment should you start with? It's quite of a personal question. Um, I think I speak for most of the paint makers when I say that ultramarine blue has been one of the first pigments that we made. Um, it's quite a cheap pigment. Ultramarines are professional pigments. Like, there's no need to look for a more beautiful blue in that price range because ultramarine just, just it, it can't be beaten. It's you can buy it for as cheap as, as five euros for a kilo, uh, depending on where you look. Um, but a bottle of, 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 of ultramarine blue for 100 grams sets you back a few euros or dollars. Um, it's a beautiful, bright blue. It's a granulating pigment, which also, uh, uh, you know, is quite desirable at the moment. Um, so it is also quite an easy pigment to mull. It doesn't have... Uh, difficulties like um, hydrophobic reactions with your binder or um, it's not lumping as uh, while you're mulling it's it's not making it difficult for you to mix with your binder and it dries beautifully when you use the right proportions so um, that's one if you're more into natural pigments any kind of ochre will do I love a yellow ochre um, also very cheap very professional still it gives you a beautiful range of earthy yellows uh, depending on what ochre you you uh, use uh, you can use red earths uh, make sure that if you want to make it easier for yourself uh, you start with a natural pigment and for a red earth that's always PR 102 so Keep in mind, PR102 is natural red iron oxide. PR101 is synthetic iron oxide. So um, whether it is caput mortum or uh, hematite or um, red ochre or whatever it's labeled, always make sure you see the pigment numbers because then you know it's a natural source or a synthetic iron oxide. Synthetic iron oxides could be a little bit more hydrophobic or more difficult to mull than natural ones, in my experience. Same goes for ochres. If you want to have a natural yellow ochre, so one that has been made out of This, this is natural yellow ochre. You want PY 4343. If you're finding a yellow iron oxide that is synthetic, it's always PY 42. So that's the difference of those two iron oxides uh, in a nutshell uh, it goes way deeper and way further than that and you have loads of different kinds of ochres so putting a pit pigment number on there really doesn't add any value um, any ochre is made up with different things and um, for an ochre or a an earth color putting PR 102 or PY43 on it, it's just kind of we're putting it, it's easy for us, right? It's a natural, but that's it. Um, it consists of so many different pieces, minerals, uh, iron oxides, um, and it differs from every PY43. Ultramarine, on the other hand, 
it's a synthetic pigment and um, that's PB29 so there are differences there within that pigment number but not as much as you would have with an earth pigment so that would be my advice to look for when you want to have a pigment that you can start with um, there are beautiful pigments every pigment is beautiful on its own but there are beautiful pigments to start with as well but most are just uh, very expensive uh, some are very difficult so if you want to get started with pain want to get the feel like okay what what it is to make pain to combine pigment and binder to work with an improvised mower or a professional mower on a glass plate to let your first pans dry or maybe put it in a tube or in a glass jar or whatever you prefer um, I, I would say start with those pigments um, I would start with a single pigment always so look for those there are brands that sell pigment mixes I would try to avoid those just for now they're beautiful mixes um, but if you want to appreciate what a pigment can do and what pigment characteristics are I would get familiar with single pigments first since uh, appreciating all the little nuances a single pigment has uh, instead of you know working with mixes that um, kind of imitate certain effects um, I think I think it would be better to start with a single pigment if you have any question okay I've seen a pigment it looks beautiful and I can afford it uh, I want to buy it because that's my favorite color uh, but I'm not sure if it's really suitable for a first time making paint uh, just comment down below uh, I'll react on it um, uh, I don't want to brag but I have about every single pigment you can think of uh, in my collection some of them very small jars just for my collection some of them I use in my regular line of paint so I make them a lot um, but I can try out and I can help you with it as well if you find out any trouble like okay um, I, I, I'm mixing a paint a few weeks back I had someone who had a yellow um, and it, they just, just they were working with it and it just didn't want to mix with the binder uh, so we looked into it um, um, that person gave me the the recipe of the binder um, so I can could see what's in there and there was nothing wrong with that so we had a look at okay what's your technique what are you doing there and uh, you know at, after some some time we found out what the problem was and why um, uh, it made beautiful paint here within five minutes on my plate and uh, with that person it, it just took an hour and still it wasn't working um, uh, so I'm happy to help in that way if I have time for it as well just let me know in the comments down below um, next video will be the binder recipe and prepping the plate I uh, hope you enjoyed this video a little bit longer than the last time uh, any questions or any follow-up subjects comment down below please if you don't already follow my channel and if you want to invest into the serious materials i've added links down below the video as well so um, again those are affiliate, affiliate links you help me with them uh, i get a little bit of income from it um, but by that i can invest in new stuff by showing you and helping you in your way to make your own very own watercolor paint hope you like the videos guys see you next time